Welcome to the Onyx Report, a program that critically analyzes the experiences, histories, and perceptions of black males in American society. I'm Dr. T. Hassan Johnson, Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Fresno State, black male advocate, and black male studies scholar. In the program, we examine current events while engaging concepts ranging from institutionalized anti-black misandry to gynocentrism from a black masculinist perspective. Our goal is to remind people of black men's humanity. Call in after a half hour to the show at 310-928-7733. All right. Welcome back to the Onyx Report with Dr. T. Hassan Johnson. Um, today is a bit of a treat. A good colleague of mine will be interviewing that I will introduce to you in a moment. Um, but, you know, as we do, since we only come uh, record twice a month, uh, I try to cover some of the significant current events uh, just to give a sense of where we are in this current moment, uh, no matter when you're listening to this to give you kind of a context for what's going on in the world uh, while we're recording today. So um, in terms of current events, and these are listed at random, so they're not in any particular order of importance. Um, but first, I want to acknowledge the 50th anniversary of the murder of activist Fred Hampton, Chicago. Um, shout outs to him and his family. If you're not if you're not knowledgeable about Fred Hampton, if you if you don't know, if you're not heard of him before, I definitely urge you to look him up. And this is kind of what I'll do with current events in general. Some of them, many of them I won't actually be able to go into depth with because we only have an hour. Um, but at the same time, these are things that I think are important and you might need to look into on your own. Um, so look into Fred Hampton again, shout outs and much respect to the sacrifice that he made. Uh, on behalf of trying to elevate the black community. Um, let's see, we have uh, Romaine Chip Fitzgerald, California's longest serving Black Panther who's still incarcerated. There's an article on peoplesworld.org about him. Look him up, look up the article uh, and find out how you can lend some support. Um, also, we have uh, George Zimmerman, killer of Trayvon Martin, suing the Martin family for apparently a hundred uh, million. Um, his Martin family and Florida prosecutors claiming they engineered false evidence in his homicide trial for the shooting for a uh, shooting dead, the unarmed black teen in 2012. So look that up. Um, we also have a case in Alabama where racist police officers planted drugs and guns on over 1000 innocent black men. And this goes back to what we've talked about re regularly on this show in terms of disposability uh, and the kind of negative, negative stereotyping of black men in that these things can happen and people take them readily and uh, don't challenge them. So look into that. There's an article on that on the AtlantaTribune.com website. Um, also, shout outs to Tommy Curry, who posted a paper um, on his uh, Facebook page, and I think Twitter, but I think definitely his Facebook page, uh, citing an October 10th, 2019 paper uh, by NYU uh, entitled Children Associate White But Not Black Men with Brilliance. Um, stereotype, a new study found uh, that one of the key uh, uh, opening passages in that paper says, our research indicates that the stereotype associating brilliance with white men more than white women is likely widespread, but also that children acquire no such stereotype about black men and women. In fact, they see black women as more likely to be brilliant than they do black men. So the same kind of stereotyping I just mentioned ends up playing out with the very concept of brilliance, right? Um, also, i uh, got an article about one Lynn Ann Berg who was spared jail time mm -hmm. as part of a plea agreement uh, because apparently she, as a teacher, had what they called in the title, quote unquote, drunken sex with students and told police she can't rem she couldn't remember anything and thus did not have to go to jail. So this is a Caucasian woman who had who apparently raped her students, uh, at least more than one. Um, and again, as I've said many times, and I've posted this many times in, in popular media, that um, many of the women who are guilty openly of raping their students, their mentees, uh, particularly their male ones, uh, suffer very little punishment more than anything, even if they do go to jail, which is usually for far less time than men, they're not necessarily regarded and, and punished in the court of public opinion. And usually their cases are quickly dismissed and forgotten about, and the term rape or sexual assault even are rarely used in relation to women. 
So something there um, to be to pay attention to. Uh, also this week we had actor Billy D. Williams come forth, uh, and it was claimed that he had identified as gender fluid. Turned out he didn't really know what the concept meant, and he was referring to the anima and animus within each of us, the masculine and feminine within each of us. So um, if you get a chance, check out. There are numerous articles about that. <clears throat> Billy D. Williams actually coming out and saying that he was actually talking about just having those kind of qualities within us and being able to recognize them. And my observation of that very briefly is that, you know, people have a problem with who gets to talk about gender. And in many ways, we've kind of fetishized the whole concept of gender to where it's only women and LGBT groups that can talk about gender and be received seriously. But cisgendered hetero black men, for example, don't, you know, aren't, are not really allowed to be uh, able to talk about gender in any kind of credible way, nor address any kind of nuance in the way they understand gender. And that's just what he did. And the only way they can interpret him was to immediately label him something that he had never even heard of. So, you know, when straight black men such as him try to articulate their experiences and reflections, it's usually not received well. And this is definitely one of the things that happened with Williams, who did not identify um, as anything other than straight. He was just merely trying to talk about his experience with gender in a more nuanced way uh, that most don't attribute or allow in regard to uh, black men. So something else to look out at. Um, Let's see. There was one Derek Goldston, Chicago food truck driver, who saved 15 people during a robbery. And this is going to come up later in the interview when we talk about the sacred black masculine. And this is something that those who follow me on social media know I've been talking about for the last month or so. And that is black men who are exemplary and 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 can demonstrate their humanity in ways that are not generally associated with black males and the importance of what that refers to so the sacred black masculine we'll talk about later but this is an example as is uh, fred hampton for as was fred hampton uh, in, in that respect so the sacred black masculine representing that masculine quotient that is positive is supportive is humane and yet not seen as such uh, particularly in popular mainstream media, but also in many of our imaginations based on the way we've been conditioned. Um, uh, there's also an article in the BBC about the Maryland trio released from prison. Uh, they were incarcerated uh, unjustly. Um, these are three black men, so you can look that up. Uh, this is happening, this has been happening regularly uh, where black men are being exonerated due to DNA evidence at unprecedented rates, mainly because they were unfairly incarcerated, unjustly incarcerated in the first place. And many of them lost decades of their lives, again, due to the very stereotypes that I've been talking about uh, since the beginning of my show. So the negative perceptions of black men has real world consequences for black men, regardless of your individual context, as long as the world sees you as black and male, you're subject to things that others uh, completely uh, don't have to experience at all. Also, look to YouTube for an interview with rapper Freddie Gibbs as he talks about being falsely accused and incarcerated for rape and how that impacted him uh, and his life and his family for that matter. And, and, you know, in that respect, opening up a conversation that many of us do not know how to really have in regard to black male innocence and sexual assault and rape. And this is an old stereotype that goes back to slavery as far as black men are concerned, uh, that we are sexual threats, violent sexual threats, and what I've called walking phalluses, weaponized phalluses, as far as uh, Western imagination is concerned. And in 2019, black men, again, still fall easily into these categories. Um, also, we have in Alabama, we have a sheriff, one uh, John Williams, who was shot by an 18-year-old white male suspect known as William Chase Johnson for apparently um, over a, a loud music. Um, and apparently the young man turned himself in. Uh, but um, shout out to the Williams family. Unfortunately, um, uh, this brother was shot down in Loudons County. So look that up in uh, Alabama if you've not heard of that. Uh, and also, of course, we have uh, Kamala Harris or Kamala Harris dropping out of the presidential race, um, which I lost no tears about considering that uh, she definitely put black male um, 
uh, uh, ex-cons or cons to to work in terms of first in unfairly incarcerating many, but then also putting them to work, putting out fires um, and, and barely, you know, acknowledging their humanity. And of course, she started to incarcerate parents in regard to the truancy of their children, which sent um, uh, so many innocent parents uh, to jail and so on and so forth. Then there's plenty more to discuss there. Maybe that'll come up in the course of the conversation. But again, I do these to kind of give you a sense whenever you may be listening to this or what the context was uh, for the moment uh, on today's uh, Onyx report. Now, as I said earlier, today is a treat because I have a good friend of mine um, who has agreed to allow me to interview him on the show. And it's hard to get him because the brother is, is <laughs> he's he's not always in the country. As a matter of fact, much of the time I'll pick up my phone to call and see how he is, and he's on the other side of the world. Uh, but this is uh, my, my good friend, Jellable Baba, storyteller, musician, author. Uh, you can find him on babathestoryteller.com, one word. Um, and you can go into his website. You can listen to video clips. And if you follow him on social media, you can see uh, regular uh, uh, videos that he does no matter where he is in the world. Um, and I, so the, a couple of things I want to put out there before we even jump into this. He is author of Road of Ash and Dust, Awakening of a Soul in Africa. Uh, it's labeled by E.L. Sears. You can find that on Amazon. And if I remember correctly, that went number one on Amazon for Africana Studies. Um, so Road of Ash and Dust, Awakening of a Soul in Africa. Uh, he's the author of and he's also a musician. He plays the Kora, uh, spelled K O. R.A., if you're not familiar, he has a couple of CDs you can also find on Amazon, Ancestral Strings, Acoustic Chora by Baba the Storyteller, and Jalia Storytelling, Stories of Music, uh, Stories and Music of West Africa uh, uh, by Storyteller Asha's Baba. So you can look that up. Um, he has, as I said, he's frequently in and out of the country. He has spoken um, in his professional capacity in every country in South America in Central America, Costa Rica, El Salvador, all throughout Mexico, Senegal, Mali, Gambia, Ghana, Guinea, France, Spain, Germany, Poland, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, in the Middle East, Qatar, Beijing, China, Jamaica, the Dominican Republic. I mean, and, and in the Dominican Republic, he was guest of the president's wife who is supporting a uh, literacy campaign in her country. So I want to welcome officially uh, one Jellaba Baba to the Onyx Report. How you doing, man? Brother, brother, thank you. <laughs> I, I appreciate you. I really do. It, it sounds like you're reading someone else's curriculum vitae, not mine. But anyway, hey. anyway, <laughs> I'm not even going to allow you to go there. So let's jump right in. You are a storyteller, which is not something, you know, we regularly hear about as an occupation. Um, and most people would assume, OK, you're 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 just speaking to little kids. Tell us who, what kind of groups and audiences do you speak to? And then we're going to go back a little bit and kind of work our way into how you got into this. All right. Let, let's let's be real about this, because you and I, when we talk, we always get down that way. We, we always come straight. Right. Mm -hmm. So let me just say this. I'm not a storyteller. There we go. All I right. Use, I use the term storyteller because it's the only word in the English language that is uh, a descriptor uh, of what I do. In the in the West African language of Bambara, I'm, I would be called a jelly. Uh -huh. uh, and in popular terms, we call this a griot. Mm -hmm. And it's a craft. It's, an, it's a craft that's been around for thousands of years. And griots were the oral historians of their people. They were the, the living, breathing repositories of knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And the to be a griot to be a jelly you are supposed to have been born into a family of griots so there's an issue there's an initiatory process to becoming a griot mm -hmm. and you know i don't want to belabor this too long but the reason why i say uh, i'm not a storyteller is because that word is limiting mm -hmm. but it's the only thing we have to deal with in the english language i'm a jelly and i'm a jelly by training so I've actually spent time in Africa living among other jelly, living among griots, and learning the craft. So for the past 25 years, I this is the work that I've been doing for the past 25 years. So, you know, I, I don't take offense because mm -hmm. I put the storyteller out there. I put that out there. Right. But it it's only um, 
maybe the superficial understanding of what I do. And for right. those for those people who uh, love entertainment or they desire what is sweet or kind, they they can have their storyteller. But it, I, I believe I do so much more than that. I, I can see, especially if you're going all over the world like this. But uh, what are the different types of groups you speak to? Because I think most would imagine, oh, okay, so you, you, you're you dealing with kindergarten, first grade, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Tell us what you do. Well, my, my work, let, let me preface it with this, because I think sometimes when people look me up, they have a problem understanding, like, how I'm doing what I'm doing and why. So a lot of my work is based on our ancestral lineage. It's not just Africa. When I put together the idea to do what I'm going to do, what I was planning to do, I based it on brothers like Paul Robeson. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember being young and hearing about this brother who was brilliant traveling the world. And I studied Robeson. Uh, I studied uh, Malcolm. Uh, I even went back and I read a lot of the speeches and, and the work of Frederick Douglass, because a lot of people don't know that he traveled outside of the country as well. Mm -hmm. So in studying a lot of these brothers, uh, I had to make a plan for myself as a black man in this country because nowhere was I accepted as a holistic being, as, as a complete being, as a man. I worked corporate for a number of years and I knew that wasn't going to last long. Mm. So I made um, a business plan to exit corporate life and to do something for myself, which, which was a gamble. Mm -hmm. But um, what I did was design something that I could do out in the world that would just benefit me uh, morally, spiritually, economically. And the venues that I traveled to, a lot of the venues are schools, uh, colleges and universities, NGOs or non-government organizations, and some government organizations, for, like when we were talking about in Dominican Republic when I worked with the the wife of the president there. So it it's a wide variety of mm -hmm. venues and organizations that I work with. It, it's kind of, I mean, I could go into detail, but then it would take up a whole hour just to talk about like one aspect of my work. Right. But people don't, people don't normally associate, you know, storytelling with um, actually speaking to administrators, speaking to politicians, speaking to, matter of fact, audiences full of teachers and, and you know, engaging workshops in, in terms of uh, race and history. Like yeah. most wouldn't associate those kinds of projects with storytelling. And I kind of wanted to put that out there just to kind of give a sense that, you know, there's a there's a different way that you've approached this. But you you mentioned, you know, starting this and transitioning out of corporate. Now, you were supporting a family at the time, too, right? Oh, man. Yeah. Um, I was not only supporting a family, but if you are if you are a brother in this country, if you're a black man, you are a veritable resource, um, mm -hmm. not just to the family that you support, but to also extended family to your community. So uh, there's a lot of hope that lies in black men who become successful in whatever venue that they venture in. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I was supporting a family, but there were also a lot of other aspects of our community that were dependent upon me. Mm. Family as well, right? Family. I mean, extended, extended family. Extended family, people mm -hmm. in the community who uh, had fallen on hard times. You you know how we do. It, I, there, are, there, are, there are probably thousands of black men out there nodding their heads right now understanding exactly what I'm talking about. While you have people say, why go into this? Just keep your job, stay with the security. You know, you're wasting a good position. How did you, did you hear those things and how did you <laughs> navigate that? I heard the veritable, why would you leave a good job? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and, mm -hmm. and really there's no such thing as a good job. I don't, I, not for a black man, at least I can't speak for anyone else. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in this society, what is considered a good job is constraining to my soul as a black man, to my spirit. And having those constraints on me in any structure, it prevented me from reaching the potential of who I was meant to be. 
Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I know people define a good job as, you know, a, a six-figure and above income. You're able to buy a house. There are all these materialistic sort of notions of, of what a good job is. Mm-hmm. But deep down inside, we all know that we're more powerful than the jobs that they use to try to define us. They can't hold us, which is why if you talk to a lot of brothers, you'll find out no matter what job they're working, you'll find out that they have other interests, that, mm-hmm. they're, that they're scholars, that they're musicians, that they uh, work within their communities, that they volunteer. There is, there's rarely any brother you're going to find who is one, so one-dimensional that they are defined by their job, by where right. they work. Right. Well, let's, let's back up a little bit. Tell us where you're from and 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 what your upbringing was like okay i was born in texas but i had a really nomadic existence growing Mm -hmm. up Uh, my family is along the black belt and i literally have hundreds hundreds of family members so from texas louisiana mississippi alabama down into florida and even in the carolinas i have families uh all across that belt Mm-hmm. And then during the migration, I had families that family members that moved up into New York, uh, Chicago, uh, Detroit, those areas. Mm-hmm. So my upbringing was kind of it was rather nomadic and it was somewhat schizophrenic, too. So I let me just say this way. My uh, my great grandfather lived to be 110 years old. Mm. Wow. We called, we called him Big Papa Rankins and he lived in. Evergreen, Alabama, which my family still has quite a bit of land there. And we have a family cemetery plot, church, Mm. a lot of things there. Now, here was the unique part of my upbringing. Um, I was born with a widow's peak. And this may may not mean much to many people. But deep in the South, in the African-American community among some, a child born with a widow's peak is meant to be a minister. Okay. 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 So this is some of that... Um, sort of folklore. Folklore, yeah. Yeah, okay. So whenever we would go visit my great-grandfather, I was never allowed to play with my cousins. They would always take me and they would put me in a room alone with my great-grandfather. And this happened for a lot of years growing up, I would say between maybe like 7 to 16, 17 years old. So I didn't get to know my cousins but I spent a lot of time with my great grandfather hmm. and I won't go into depth on that, but my great aunts, my great uncles, they did that because they said there was a, a purpose that I had. Mm-hmm. So now that was somewhat of my Christian upbringing. Mm-hmm. You know, my grandmother, my um, great grandfather was uh, AME pastor. Right. And so, but here's the schizophrenic part of my upbringing. I don't know if anyone else can relate to this. My the women in my family would send me up north to be with my uncles Mm. and during the summers I would go up north. My uncles were Muslims in the nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. Okay, so during the summers I would go to like mosque one and I would receive that sort of training indoctrination and then I would go back down south and I was a Christian (laughs) again. So I had, I had this schizophrenic upbringing and, and a nomadic existence where I was literally living everywhere, uh, existing all over the country. And by the time I graduated, by the time I left elementary school, brother, I had attended more than 13 elementary schools. Wow. So I was in one breath uh, a nationalist, black nationalist, mm-hmm. and in another breath, you know, I was being trained to host revival in so, you know, say what you will, but that's sort of uh, a little snapshot of my upbringing. But your father was in the nation too, right? No, my uncles were in the nation. Okay. Uh, my stepdad was a, um, he was a musician. Oh, okay. He's a musician, played saxophone. And my step, and there were people in the nation who were musicians as well. And I don't know if you remember this, but before Farrakhan took over after Elijah Muhammad died, Farrakhan was a violinist Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. he was a musician. So there were a lot of people in the nation back in the day who were musicians, but they Mm -hmm. didn't go out and perform in clubs or anything like that. They would meet in other people's homes. 
So my stepdad, you know, they were fishing for him. Um, you know, the term fishing when they would go out. <laughs> if we could explain it later. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh-huh. They were fishing for him and he, they ended up spending a lot of time at our home. And then my uncles got into it. And then my uncles pulled me in when I started spending time with my uncles. So how did how did the women in the family in the South, how did they interpret, you know, this this kind of masculine training you're getting in the North with the Nation of Islam? How did that how was that reconciled on a day to day basis when you moved back to the South? You know, it's difficult for me to explain because um, the women like my grandmother, for example, she had major problems with the nation. I mean, she was a, she was a Christian, a deep Christian woman, devout. Um, and my uncles, whenever they would come visit the South, I would they would have these raging arguments mm-hmm. <laughs> going back and forth. Mm-hmm. And and I wish she were alive now at this stage of my life so I could have uh, other conversations with her. But her whole thing about sending me up north was about me being around men. She looked yeah. at my uncle. She looked at my uncles as men, and I think she ignored the uh, the nation aspect, the the FOI uh, aspects of what they were engaged in. I think she ignored that. She wanted. She would even say to my uncle, "Please, we want to make him a man. He needs to be a man." And mm-hmm. she would send me up north. Now, see, but it, so was there kind of a. a you know, a patriarchy versus matriarchy dynamic, or how would okay. you describe it? In in my family dynamic, there's very much, and I, oh, not a Eurocentric patriarchal um, archetype or existence. Mm-hmm. The patriarch in my family, patriarchal existence in my family was based around the men uh, that, uh, for example, in, in the South, I'm gonna, let me give you an example. Um, there was definitely a strong division of labor in my family between the men and the women. When I say a division of labor, I mean, we're talking about agrarian communities. I'm going back to that time. Mm-hmm. And the men in the family, uh, a lot of them chopped lumber, wood. Um, they worked the land. You, you, they did a lot of things. So here's an example. In the mornings, and this tradition has still somewhat in my family, the the men would get up and the women would have gotten up before and they would have made food. They would have made breakfast. And mm-hmm. the men would sit around this table and the men would eat first before mm-hmm. it, before anyone else, before the children, before the women. The women would make the food. The men would eat first. And then the men would leave uh, before the sun came up and head out to go do the work of the farm, chopping down the trees, plowing mm-hmm. the fields. But they would eat first. Right. And the 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 work that the women were doing, um, they would stay behind and they had opportunities to continue with their meals, to feed the children, to get them off to school. But this is a tradition that existed in my family. I was just talking to some of the women in my family recently. I was in Alabama. And this is a tradition that actually existed up until just a year ago uh, at our family reunions. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure why, uh, you know, some traditions fall to the side or not. I'm not sure why this is falling to the side, but there's, I mean, it's a discussion to be had among our family members. Right. But uh, we we say patriarchy. I don't want to, I don't want, I really do not, like the term patriarchy because it applies some Eurocentric notion of manhood, Mm -hmm. which does not apply to black men in any way, shape or form. So I hesitate to use the term patriarchy because there is much more of a holistic approach to gender, to sexuality when we're dealing with who we are as black men and how we approach sexuality and gender. And yet there's still a tension there. Like I know with with my family, it was split. You know, I I was raised with my mother and on my mother's side of the family, it was all women. As a matter of fact, um, you know, in terms of the, uh, 
through the, up to the grandparent level, there was one male in the family mm-hmm. um, other than myself. And then my son became the next one. Whereas on my father's side of the family, you know, you saw these, there were more men present. And so there was almost kind of this dynamic, this, you know, very divergent kind of experience in, in many ways where being with, you know, my mother's side of the family was all women. And being with my father's side of the family, you saw more men, especially in positions of head of household. So there was an interesting kind of of difference there. Um, now, in terms of how you were, you know, raised, were you were you with all of these women, or did, were you primarily so, with your mother, or how did that work? The majority of the time, because because my existence was so nomadic, the majority of the time I was around women. Mm-hmm. The majority of my time, and I think that's why it was so urgent. Um, during those times when we traveled through the South, why they put me with my great grandfather, why they sent me to Detroit, you know, to be around my uncles. But I'll, I'll tell you this: the the environment was not always the healthiest for me as a young black male, being surrounded only by women, mm. because this society puts pressure on black families in a way that it doesn't put on any other familial structure. Mm -hmm. And I've learned over the decades that a lot of what I was, was suffering or going through as a young black male from the women in my family was an indirect way of this society punish me for being born a black male. Okay. I don't know if that makes sense to you. The women acted as somewhat surrogates uh, sometimes, not all, for this society to keep me from reaching the potential. And some of it was women wanted to keep me safe. They didn't want me to go through what I had gone through. What, Like there were lynchings in my family. Mm-hmm. For mm-hmm. example, my grandmother as a child was forced to witness the lynching of one of her favorite uncles mm-hmm. in uh, Conecuh County in Alabama. So you take a child who's been scarred, a young woman who's been scarred by that, and her ability to parent is not going to be uh, what it should be. But that societal pressure or that societal pathology is passed down through her to this black male child, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, like, I can say a phrase, and I'm I'm going to say this phrase. And there's not a brother out there who can't finish this phrase. And and I'm not going to say it completely. An N-word ain't right. Leave it there. Now, right. I, we, don't, we don't have to discuss it. But the, mm-hmm. fact, the fact that there are brothers out there who I don't know, have never met. Mm-hmm. You don't know. We have never met. But the fact that we all can finish that phrase. Right. It says something about the pathology that was passed into us through our community right where where well yeah where where by the time you get to like the 1980s um Mm -hmm. it's it's commonly spoken you know oh oh Uh, niggas ain't niggas ain't shit yes it's common you went in and threw it out there, but yeah, <laughs> I was, yeah. I was trying I, to God. No, it, it's mainly because I, I want to make sure that we, that, you know, people understand. And, and you're right. It is a phrase we've all heard, uh, but the, the commonness of it says something. As a matter of fact, I want to play a clip and I want to play a clip. This is a clip from Dr. Julia Hare, um, uh, uh, she, the late wife of Dr. Nathan Hare, founded the first Africana Studies Department at uh, San Francisco State in, in the late 1960s. Now, I want I want to preface this by saying I have nothing but respect for Dr. Hare, Dr. Julia Hare. But I want there's a clip I want to play. I want to play about 43 seconds of it, and I want you to respond to what you hear in relation to what we're talking about. Um, so let me see if my engineer has that clip ready to go change it see we have a system that would not like to see black males and black females together they would not like to see that happening at all because once we come together they understand the power of the strength of the black woman the queen of the universe they know that her strength they also know they also know the power of the black male the warrior if you would turn him loose he will protect also his family and things that need to be done. And because they understand that if our relationships are together, 
then they will lose. But if our relationships are torn up, then we can forever be treated in certain ways by the oppressors. That's why they gave us something called integration, which is nothing but the illusion of inclusion. They gave us this. Right. Now, Julie Hare is a very powerful sister, especially, you know, I think most people became really introduced to her when she started doing um, the uh, uh, State of Black America right. um, lesson. She and, and Nathan. She and Nathan were actually... Yeah. Yeah, they did. They did a lot of their research together. They did a lot of presentations together. Um, very powerful. Matter of fact, I think she had Alzheimer's, and I think that's what caused her 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 to pass. But um, so I want to preface that by saying I have a great deal of respect for her. And if you go and to those of you who haven't heard her, go listen to her on YouTube. She has some profound insights on education and so on. She's a brilliant sister. But in that clip, you know, tell me what you heard. Listen, um, this is a part of our conditioning. In this is the aspect of our conditioning where we are not permitted to be critical, especially mm -hmm. constructively critical of one another. And we should be. I grew, look, part of my rite of passage of coming into my awareness was through Nathan and Julia here. All mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But you have to examine how she situated her narrative. Right. She, sit, she situated black women as queens of the universe. Mm -hmm. And there's not a brother out there who will not have a problem with that. Okay? But she situated black men as warriors. Right. As basically foot soldiers. Right. Now, here's, here's where the critique has to go. Why are we not situating black men as kings there of the go. universe because there a queen must a queen must have a king mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and one without the other is weak yes and so when we talk about and look i know people are going to um i know people are going to have a lot to say about you know saying anything what they deem negative about julia here but we have to examine these things and then we have to get in the psychology of them so yes. that you don't continue to repeat the madness that we've inherited. Right. Because this is a, this madness is a part of our legacy, right? There is no there is no reason in the world not to situate the black man as a king of the universe if you are going to situate the black woman as the queen of the universe. It only makes sense. Now, see that that's. That's where, in my work, I talk about the, the development of what, what's considered an artificial gynarchy in the black community. One that is a product of policy, uh, policy going back to the 50s, the 70s, most particularly those two eras, where you had, and especially we see it becoming very crystallized in the 1970s, mm -hmm. where you see two divergent paths. This is after the civil rights movement, which technically was never supposed to end. It was an ongoing struggle. But in response to the civil rights movement, what we saw the state begin to do is highly incarcerate and underdeveloped black males. Uh, you know, limited employment, limited educational opportunities, incarceration, the war on drugs kicks in in the 70s and the 80s. And you even have Nixon's uh, cabinet coming forward and, and, and outwardly acknowledging that this was very purposefully directed at the black community, most particularly black males. Whereas at the same time, poor black women had either access to state resources like welfare or working class to, you know, quote unquote, middle class, because the black mm -hmm. community's middle class is a very different dynamic. We're, we're equated with the white poor in terms of income. But anyway, um, it, 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 middle class, or working class black women could go to college. So you have this divergent experience taking place. And I make the argument that what we end up with is this kind of artificial gynarchy where uh, whether we're talking as heads of households, uh, business production, new business production, black women right now are considered the leading demographic to create new businesses, even though 99% of their businesses have one employee. These dynamics have produced a context where we have this kind of, uh, you know, situation where women are actually considered in some respects the, the, the leaders of the community and men are, are not. So what I hear in Dr. Mm -hmm. Hare's statement is, is <clears throat> and what you pointed out is this dynamic where even in celebration of black men and women, it's still not conceptualized that black men are on equal footing. 
no. unequal terms. And, no. and, 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 and what it is, is it's kind of a shift to a queen drone dynamic, like, you know, one where you might see with ants or bees, right, where you have women as the queen and, and the queens and the, and the aristocracy and men as the worker drones and the warrior drones. You know, that's what I heard invoked in that dynamic rather than bringing in the king dynamic. Right. So I, so that kind of framework goes to me to the kind of conditioning that many black males have grown up with. Can you talk a little bit about conditioning? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I'm going to say this because I'm not I'm not taking issue with you at all, because to me, you're not stating an argument. You're stating a basic fact when you talk about gynarchy in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. There there is nothing to be debated or argued about when you talk about this. So I don't, I, I don't look at you as positing an argument. I look at you as stating a fact that we need to have more discussions about. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, as far as conditioning in our society, I'm, I'm going to go a little further back than you. Okay. Because I, I want to take your timeline back to before 1619. I want to I go back to the era of seasoning. Mm -hmm. and, and we all know what mm -hmm. seasoning is. So mm -hmm. um, we, were, we are not born to be enslaved. No man, woman in any part of this earth is born to be enslaved. Slaves have to be trained. They have to be made. And even in the process of trying to make someone a slave, there are those who resist. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, this making of a slave was called seasoning. And for those who aren't aware, I'll just give a basic um, outline of what seasoning is. It is when you wreak, seek to instill terror in another human being in order to take control of them. So, you know, this was the process of cutting babies out of the bellies of black women uh, and then slamming the babies against trees or stomping on their heads with the boots and threatening black men who might move towards protecting these women with death. And there were a lot of black men who were killed. Now, mm -hmm. I want to I want to say this because if we come up through the era of enslavement and through reconstruction, the same terror tactics existed through recon through reconstruction. In fact, after reconstruction, what they're calling um, Jim Crow and all of these things, that was an era of terror. OK, mm -hmm. it was an era of seasoning. I'm going to keep using that word. OK, and mm -hmm. this is a, the seasoning is a form of conditioning. So if we come up through uh, enslavement through reconstruction and we let's take it all the way up into the early 1900s right and what they falsely called red summer right a uh, series of riots which were not riots were which were actually slaughters and massacres of black people in fact i'm sorry i'm going to go back reconstruction there are narratives of black bodies littering the roads of the South and mass graves. And we don't talk about these things. So if we're going through these eras of seasoning and reconstruction and, and terror, and we reach the time that we are now, then when we see black men killed, it makes sense to us. Mm -hmm. It is a mm -hmm. continuation of the conditioning and of the seasoning. And who was the sister... Um, Oh, uh, Cress Wilson. Francis Cress Wilson. Francis Cress Wilson. Mm -hmm. Remember, she had interviewed young black males, and she said, do you want to be like your heroes? And she named Malcolm and Martin. And they said, no. And she asked them why. And they said, because when you rise up, they will kill you. Right? You know, that's incredibly important. Because mm -hmm. even recently, I went to see, um, I went to see this uh, film that's, that came out last week, Queen and Slim. Right. Um, which I have some, you know, severe issues with, but um, Lena w uh, Waith, Wraith, I think it is, uh, made the film, um, and it is, in many respects, you know, a black women's perspective on a particular, you know, ride or die, Bonnie and Clyde kind of story. But in the dynamic, there's a point where um, the black male character and the black female character are shot, right? Mm -hmm. The theater gasped when she was shot. I didn't hear mm -hmm. a sound when he was, and I talked about this on social media. There was, it, it, you know, there was almost a kind of acceptance that that would, that you know, that was going to take place. But there was an almost kind of, you know, how dare this happen when it came to her? Now I have, I have, I have many problems with with that type of film because you could tell, you know, black males, especially African American males, had little to do 
with that film in terms of the writing, you know, the production, the directing, the acting is very, there's very little. And in it, we're portrayed as ignorant, naive, violent, traitorously greedy and childish and all these kind of dynamics, even to the point where, you know, when the characters are under threat by racist police officers, mm -hmm. uh, she's shot first, twice, in fact, and, and he's kind of an afterthought, which according to the the data is actually the opposite you know it's really black men are sought after more often than not when it comes to violence especially at the hands of police but i also want to back up to something you said so i'm i'm, I'm saying that with queen and slim i could see you know what you were talking about but going back to the gynarchy you took it back to the 1600s and i want to be clear it's not that I think it, it, it only starts in the 50s and the 70s. I'm saying there are layers of it that begin at different points in time. And the 70s is almost like the tip of the spear. Oh, but yeah. I want to give you credit here. And because there's a lot of people on social media that saw me post this quote. That, you know, they didn't know where I had gotten it. From Martin Luther King's book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. Um, you sent me uh, a passage from the book that I really wanted to thank you for um, because it was really powerful. And, I, and I'm going to read a portion of it uh, mm -hmm. very quickly. This is from Dr. King himself. He said, because the institution of marriage had been illegal under slavery and because of the indiscriminate sex relations, often with their white masters, mothers, and he's talking about black mothers, could identify their children, but frequently not their children's fathers. Moreover, the women being more generally in the house and charged with the care of white masters children were more often exposed to some education and a sense, though minimal, of personal worth. Hence, a matriarchy had early developed. After slavery, it persisted because in the cities there was more employment for women than men. Mm -hmm. uh, he's talking about black women and black men. Uh, though both were unskilled, the women could be used in domestic service at low wages. The women, the woman became the support of the household and the matriarchy was reinforced. And this actually ends in the 70s where due to the second wave feminist movement, women can transition out of domestic work into clerical work, education, mm -hmm. so on, nursing, so on and so forth. But King is taking this notion he calls it a matriarchy i call it a gynarchy because i think it extends beyond the mother but still he takes it back to slavery like you're 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 suggesting and i'm in full agreement with because there there are layers of this that happen at different points in time and even by the time you get to the uh, 1929 post 1929 great depression uh when the state steps in in terms of providing resources for women uh and i should say uh actually after world war Two, two, uh, yeah. you, 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 where you have you know uh, widows who need mm -hmm. support. This becomes the rationale for welfare, and so the, the the man in the house rule, you know, excluding men from being able to to not only receive it but be in families who receive it. That comes out of a very particular context. Yeah, so these does. types of impacts, the the way this impacts the black community, is such where you know women have a, a degree of stability, and as he pointed out, a sense of self worth and mm -hmm. some access to education that black men don't have. And so what we have is a divergent life experience where black well, men I, and women fundamentally live different lives. But go right. ahead. I would also say, look, we have to remember too that King wrote that passage in 1967. Mm -hmm. That was 1967. Mm -hmm. um, I, would, I would say that your concept of a gynarchy is an evolution Yes. Uh, of what yes. King was talking about. And these are the things that I'm talking about when I say that we have to evolve our theses of what we're dealing with within our community. And I think sometimes what we what we do is we fall victim to this sort of stagnant uh, ideation, this, this sort of stagnant sort of like um, the way we did things in the past is the way we're going to do them today, mm -hmm. right? And this is why when you're talking about the, the resources that have been placed uh, toward black women, what we leave out of the conversation are the, not only the economic aspects, but reasons for what are the reasons for this. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and there's, look, we could talk about sexuality. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the, look, the United Nations put forth a charter on genocide. And I didn't prepare to talk about this. I wish I had it in front of me. But in this charter on genocide, when you read it, it's laying out what is happening to the black community in the United States. There yeah. is a genocide occurring. I, and I know some, some of your listeners are brilliant enough to go ahead and pull this up. But things such as uh, an imbalance, because when I was young, 
we were talking about the black family, mm-hmm. all right? We weren't talking about black women. We weren't talking about black men. Right. We were talking about the black family. And one of the things that is happening now is children are being adopted out of the community and being raised by people other than people in the community. Now, if you read the United Nations Charter, that is a form of genocide. I'm not saying this. I'm telling you what the United Nations Charter is saying. Mm -hmm. And it's also one of the reasons why in many cultures, you are not allowed to adopt an indigenous baby, a Native American baby. Why? Because it is considered a form of genocide. We so, saw the same kind of thing in, in Australia. In we saw the this, Aborigines, absolutely. The same thing in Australia. So our people here are being having this era of genocide thrust upon us. And I hate to say this, brother, but many of us are sleepwalking through it. Well, it's it's. I think in many ways you, it's surprising what one can get used to. But this yeah, is that's a, that's a way and, to say it. And although there are layers of this too, you know, the aggression toward uh, the black community obviously begins with slavery in the Western Hemisphere. But there are layer there there are overlapping layers that take place over time. You know, this instance of it, the latest one I'm pointing to is right after the Civil Rights Movement, which was a movement predicated on the family. Because the family was the foundation of the church and the church was the foundation of the movement, especially since going back to the 19th century, there were very few places we could legally congregate but the church. So it wasn't surprising that the political movement of the 20th century came out of the black church Mm -hmm. at a time during the Cold War where international media allowed for this small black population to have a global uh, kind of impact in terms of the stories they're telling and even the video images of women being you know bitten by dogs old mm-hmm. women and people mm-hmm. being beaten that had a global import so we got the attention of the world we had the attention of the world and it became necessary in many ways to underdevelop this community because of the impact they were having and one way to go about that and there were many overlapping ways was to set you know men and women against each other by creating a very different experience for both. Mm-hmm. Well, you know all I mean? the, our experiences as black men often are there are attempts to delegitimize anything mm-hmm. that we do. There are attempts to marginalize us. And in fact, very rarely in media will you see um, will you see images of black men who have their own agency. Absolutely. Very rarely will you see black male agency. And let me give you look, because if we're going to be honest, well, we, only, we, we only got a couple minutes left. And there's something else I want to ask you. But go ahead. OK, let me put this out there. And I'll just say this. I'll give an example. I was in Qatar recently. I was in the mm-hmm. Middle East mm-hmm. and I got a message from a few women um, and they were berating me for having traveled to the Middle East. Mm. And they were berating me because they were talking about Sharia law and what happens there. And why would you do this? Why would you do that? One of them was a French woman who I've known for quite a number of years. She lives in the United States. But let me, I'm going to cut this short and just say this. She was talking about Sharia law and how oppressive it was. Mm -hmm. And how could I go to Qatar? And my argument to her was, you live in the United States. Mm. You ignore the pain of black men and Mm. what we've gone through for hundreds of years. So I asked her, how could you live in the United States? If you care so much about the humanity and the Mm -hmm. dehumanization of human beings, how can you ignore what is happening where you live and ask me while I'm traveling to a country that is perfectly safe for me? I felt safer in Qatar than I ever have in Alabama. Alabama. I'm just going to say that. No, no, absolutely. You, you because you're going on a roll, but go ahead. Oh, no, because you're talking about a population of men who could readily and still are, in fact, be raped by white women merely and, and, and have the accusation that he raped her as the means to control him. In other Wait, words, the development me, of a lynch mob as punishment for not me, being I, allowed to be sexually vulnerable to white women it, it is a historical fact for black men. I have to put this out. In the 80s, I was in Anniston, Alabama. And I was warned to be careful because the highest incidents of rape were of black men Mm. in that part of the country. Mm. So 
these are things we don't seriously talk about. We talk the lynchings were also there were sexual components to these lynchings, and we don't talk about this. Absolutely not. I mean, over ninety percent, uh, if not more, of the lynchings that took place had a sexual component, whether it mm -hmm. had to do with the removal or mm -hmm. mutilation of the penis or the testes or yes. the anus. I mean, there were yes. always there was always a sexual component for men and women. But overwhelmingly, black men were those who were subject to these lynchings. But right. the question I wanted to ask before we leave, because we only got about four minutes, and I apologize it All took right. this long, because you and I talk, we can talk for hours. Um, <laughs> but when you travel to these places, what is the perception of black men um, that you've grown you know, familiar with from these different areas? I'm, I'm going to say this, and it will not. I'm, I'm just going to say this. One of the reasons why I travel is to connect with the diaspora, okay? Um, and I try to connect with those like-minded uh, kindred spirits out there who know who we are collectively. Mm -hmm. The image, <clears throat> the image. there are two different camps. There is a popular image of black men that is the, you know, the rapper, the gangster, the musician, the act, you know, and there are these images that exist. But when you get with those people who are of substance and consciousness and, and educated, and I'm not talking about within academia, but who are aware, you start to see that there is a degree of reverence and respect for black men that unless you travel outside of this country, you may never experience in your life. Mm -hmm. I, was in, I was traveling on the, in the um, mountains of Mexico once, and I went to the, among these people who claimed their Mayan lineage. Mm. And when I walked in with these people, they greeted me, and, I, this, and I'm not being facetious here, they greeted me as a god. Mm. Mm. Now, this is, I'm, I'm being serious here. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. In, in their history, in their folklore, in, in all that they were maintaining of their Mayan ancestry, their relationship to Africans, to black people, was that we were gods who came to visit them periodically. And they told me stories about these things. So that's just an example of when we travel outside the borders. See, Malcolm warned us back in the 60s about um, being only, having our, our, our fight here and not taking it out internationally. Mm -hmm. And most brothers will remember these speeches. I mm -hmm. chose to go international for a lot of those reasons, mm -hmm. not to remain domestically, because I feel like in many ways, when we remain here, we become domesticated. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we travel out into the world, then we can be and exist who, who we are supposed to be and reach our potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and that's, I mean, I'm not going to take away at all from your skill because this has a lot to do with it. But you've gotten, you know, like like Michael Jackson treatment in other countries <laughs> where you can't walk down the street. And it's funny to me because, you know, being in L.A. or the you know, Southern California area, you'll walk around and, you know, nobody knows. You'll see you nobody engage. Got a clue. Right. <laughs> but then you go to Colombia or Qatar yeah. and people are screaming your name and listen, chasing you down, down the street. Brother. J.A. Rogers wrote about this in the 1920s in Sex and Race. Mm -hmm. it, it, this information is not hidden from us, okay? This information is out there. J.A. Rogers wrote about troops who were stationed uh, in France and that women were tearing down the, the fences when they were trying to take these brothers out of the country. You know, Rogers writes, Rogers had written about a lot of this, and we're not giving him the credit as a social and physical anthropologist as we should because he didn't come through the approved areas of Eurocentric academia. But you know, you, 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 you know what, man? I'm, I might have to bring you back for a part two because <laughs> uh, we're we're at that limit. But I, I do want to thank you, brother. I, I no, no. I want to thank you for for doing the show. We might have to do a part two, and I want to thank the audience for listening to the Onyx Report. Uh, we will be back. Um, remember, it's first and third Wednesdays of each month. So you know, keep an eye out for us on the 18th of this month, and um, we hope to hear back from you. All right. Peace.